All right, welcome back to CS50. This is the start of week 11 and the second to last week of lectures in the course. This is a very sad time, of course. The course is winding down. You have your last problem set in your hands, last quiz is coming up, and then, of course, the climax of the course will take place over the course of December and January as we head toward the final projects. So we will provide more logistics over the next few weeks regarding the CS50 Fair, which is scheduled for Friday, January 9th, the last Friday of reading period. So more on that in the days to come. Uh, final project proposals, of course, were due a little bit ago, a few minutes ago. We will follow up with you with, to approve or deny or request changes to those over the next several days. Do check in with your TF if you've not heard back from them yet. Uh, say within a week or so. Um, and know too that you will likely be assigned to either your own TF or to another TF as an advisor of sorts for the final project so that each of the TFs can play to their strengths when it comes to the range of projects that um, you guys have inevitably adopted. So today is about thinking beyond the scope of the course and thinking about deployment of the kinds of ideas we've talked about in this course in the real world. Trying to answer questions of scalability. If you now have the ability to write software and you have the ability to make this software available to anyone and everyone, say on the internet, exactly what challenges do you face when you start getting more than just one user, more than just a few dozen, more than a few hundred, more than a few thousand users? How do you actually scale and dare say commercialize software once you've begun, uh, once you've completed its initial development? So today's focus will be in a sense about how to go about commercializing one's uh, software or how to go about starting one's own tech startup. So we'll touch on some of those ideas. But there's plenty more to come in the realm of computer science, if you would have us. Um, this is uh, some of the options for life after CS50. These are all courses being offered this spring. CS51 is sort of the natural next step for those of you who are considering majoring in or minoring in computer science. So certainly dive into that if you are able to. CS105 is a new course taught by two individuals, one of them the current dean of the faculty in arts and sciences and the former teacher for this course, Mike Smith. So take a look at that if you're more interested in not so much spending 15 and 20 hours a week coding and hunched over in front of your computer, but interested more in a seminar type class where you need to have savvy with and familiarity with technology and such, but it's more of a discussion and reading oriented course. So take a look at that new one as well. CS124 is data structures and algorithms. This is a wonderfully uh, fun course, if challenging course, in that it continues our own discussion of data structures and algorithms. So we certainly covered the basics, arrays, linked lists, uh, binary search trees, hash tables, but we stopped short of really diving into more sophisticated data structures, and there are plenty of options out there. And it's important, certainly, when you're actually solving real problems with large data sets, whether for research, for fun, um, or certainly for work, you already perhaps have appreciated from this course that even the smallest of design decisions can actually have have very real world ramifications for how long your code takes to run or how much space it takes up. So that's a fun course if you'd like to dive into more of those kinds of questions. It's sort of half theory, half coding. So it's a nice mix of the two. And finally, CS171 visualization. It was a new course last year and focuses on the use of computers, the use of um, technology to present data in visually interesting and in, say, sociologically compelling ways. So do check that one out as well. And to help you check out these courses so that you don't have to wait a couple of months and actually commit to shopping period, what we're going to do this Wednesday is invite four members of the CS department to join us for small teaser guest lectures. So we'll have the faculty members from CS51, from 171, and then also CS61 as well. Join us this Wednesday for quick teasers on each of those courses. In fact, there's more courses certainly beyond the spring next fall. Uh, CS61, and I'll just, I love all these courses equally, let's say. Um, CS61 didn't actually exist in my day, but I would have taken it, frankly, had it uh, existed. This is sort of, for those of you certainly more comfortable, those of you who like to think of yourselves as aspiring hackers, or really just like some of the low level stuff we did in the course, whether it was the crypto stuff, the dictionary stuff, where really you were close to the hardware and really playing with uh, some of the finer features of C. Uh, that is perhaps a precursor to what's uh, known as uh, CS161, the operating systems course, which was reputed in my day at least to be this 40-hour-a-week uh, of work um, 
behemoth. Uh, it's since uh, been tamed a little bit and some of the material that used to be in it is now in CS61, but do check this out as well. For instance, the first problem set I believe in CS61, and many of the TFs can speak to this having taken it now, is to defu defuse a so-called binary bomb, whereby Matt Welsh, uh, the course's instructor, has implemented a binary, uh, Linux executable, that if you run it, or you're prompted for a password, if you type the correct password, great, the bomb is diffused. If you type the incorrect password, an email is sent to the teaching fellow saying deduct one point from my problems at score because I failed to diffuse this thing properly. Um, so what you have to do is whip out your old friends like GDB, uh, even object dump, some of the more uh, esoteric uh, tools and features that we alluded to or showed you during the semester to try to do a bit of forensics and figure out what the password is without ever actually guessing and guessing wrong. So it's wonderfully fun. Um, uh, I myself took it on just for fun last year uh, and thanks to GDB was able to uh, plow through it. So those of you still dragging your feet on GDB, it will come back to haunt you, perhaps. Uh, CS121 is a very different course. It's entirely theory oriented. So the problem sets are uh, thought problems, uh, short answer type problems, and about the theory of computation. What does it mean to actually solve computers at all with the computer? What problems exist in this world that you simply cannot solve or cannot solve in a certain amount of time simply because of fundamental limits on computing as we know it today. This is one of mo the most challenging courses that I took as an undergrad. Um, and frankly, it's only in retrospect years later that I absolutely love the course and um, TF did for several years in graduate school. Um, but it's a very different flavor course. And so if you like the theoretical aspects of this course, if you have sort of a math background or applied math leaning, this is a particularly interesting course as well. Finally, CS141 Computing Hardware um, picks up really where we just scratched the surface last week, talking about assembly language and compilation. Um, in my day, we actually built the essence of a CPU, literally with a breadboard and lots of little wires. A lot of this is done through simulation these days, but the same ideas are still there. So if you want to learn a bit more about how computers themselves work, how a CPU works, um, that too is a fun course. And then I couldn't help um, in my last few minutes this morning in prepping um, give you some suggestions on random courses that I took as an undergrad that I think are fantastic and are completely irrelevant to computer science. But as a grad student, I audited, didn't even take it for any kind of credit, Anthro 1010, which is Introduction to Archaeology. And unfortunately, halfway through grad school, realized maybe I'd rather be an archaeology grad student. Um, but I stayed with computer science and have ever since then uh, subscribed to Archaeology Magazine. Um, so it's had some lasting effects on me. It's actually in my duffel bag today. Um, but if you're looking for a fun, low-key course, Course, this is actually wonderful. And actually, they made wonderful use, um, I can spin it this way, of technology. It was Google Earth had recently been released by Google around the time I um, audited this class. And the instructors made brilliant use of this tool to show us dig sites in the Middle East, to zoom in on literally the hut where one of the faculty members had stayed for the past several months. And it certainly wasn't in perfect detail, but it was just a wonderful use, frankly, of teaching tools. Um, and something that's freely available that you probably have seen as well. Uh, Dramatic Arts 1, um, which is now, I don't know why they renamed it the more cliche 101 now, uh, but it was once Dramatic Arts 1. This is sort of a survey of theater. You spend a week on direction, a week on lighting, a week on sound, a week on acting. If you like this kind of thing, um, it was wonderfully fun. And then finally, Gov 1540, quite the spectrum here. Um, is the American presidency, taught by one of the house masters, Roger Porter, who spent years with uh, Gerald Ford and Ronald Reagan and other administrations as well. And most of the class is like story time, where he talks about the conversation he had with Ford or Reagan, and it was wonderful. And when I took it, it was co-taught by two professors. Nowadays, it's just Porter, um, which I'm sure makes it twice as much fun, twice as many stories to tell. So completely off subject, but uh, if you take nothing else away from CS50, perhaps those random course suggestions. But today is about scalability as well, so something a bit more on point. And what I did was went back to um, uh, some records I had from several months ago. I attended the MySQL conference out in California. And this is a bunch of geeks who get together to talk about databases and talk about MySQL specifically and talk about MyISAM and InnoDB and some of the buzzwords you might have seen while playing with PHP MyAdmin and these tools of late. And what was really neat about this conference was its panel, where they had a number of uh, representatives from top websites, YouTube, Facebook, Wikipedia, and a bunch of others, sitting on stage just answering questions.
question after question from the moderator. And all these questions were about ultimately their use of databases and MySQL in particular.、Um, but ultimately, it, was a fast, it offered some fascinating insights into what it means to run a large website these days and what it means for the technologies underlying them. So the companies involved in this particular panel were MySQL, the company itself, Sun, Flickr, Photolog, Wikipedia, Facebook, and YouTube. And parenthetically, here are as of April 2008, their Alexa ranking. So there's a bunch of entities on the internet that try to rank websites in terms of their popularity and number of hits per day and that sort of thing. So the smaller number means you're closer to the top of the list. So YouTube is a huge site, similarly as Facebook, huge now. So they have very low numbers, they, very high rankings, in other words, whereas not all that many people hang out at mysql.com every day. Uh, but this gives you a sense of the range of participants, and they were asked a few questions. So they were asked, for instance, how many MySQL physical servers do you have to drive your traffic? And again, realize the spectrum. YouTube and Facebook, like these are very serious technological operations these days. So their answers were as follows MySQL, the company itself, Runs its own web infrastructure website with what's called one master and three slaves. And as the name implies, this means they have one main database and then they replicate it. They duplicate it three times. And what people typically do is they do all writes to the master, but all reads from the slaves. The presumption being that you have more reads than you have writes. So this is this other interesting trade off one can consider.、Um, and what this means again is that if they do a SQL insert, it goes to one database, but if they do a select, Or something like that, it comes from another, one of these duplicate databases. So it's a very common approach to scalability. Sun, the company that manufactures hardware, software,、uh, an operating system as well called Solaris for MySQL servers themselves, they now own MySQL as well, which is how they got on the panel, presumably.、Uh, Flickr has 166 MySQL servers, realizing that, realize that Flickr is one of these Web 2.0 companies, it's really user driven, and so there's constant writes and updates to the site. So, it kind of makes sense that it's fairly database heavy.、Uh, Photolog 37, Wikipedia,、um, they didn't answer this for some reason.、Um, Facebook, 900 masters and 900 slaves. And across those 1,800 physical servers, they claimed as of April to have some 30,000 databases. So, recall there's this distinction between server that you connect to and the actual database that you use, which is a software notion like you guys have been doing. But still,、um, even the number of physical servers there is remarkable. And then the first answer from YouTube in a series of、uh, strange answers was, I can't say,、uh, which was an oddly recurring theme for a guy who was on an invited panel to talk about his company's infrastructure. So,、um, number of DBAs these companies answer. So, a DBA, database administrator, it's the guy who runs the databases, designs the tables, designs the schemas, and tells the developers what the tables are. That they can insert data into and grab data from. You guys of late, thus, have been sort of、uh, developer and DBA rolled into one.、Uh, MySQL has one tenth of a DBA. Apparently, this guy spends only 10% of his time doing database things. Sun claimed to have 1.5 such people. Flickr, zero. The guy had apparently just quit as of the time of the panel. <laughs> But they normally have one.、Uh, Photolog had one. Wikipedia, apparently, everyone there kind of wears multiple hats. And frankly, even from what I could tell from this one panel, I don't know these guys certainly, but I've never seen a more laid back group of people than the people who run an amazing website, Wikipedia.、Uh, Facebook had two DBAs, which is remarkable in that how much hardware they have, how much software they run. But apparently, as of April, there were really just two people in charge of maintaining the databases or the designs. Um, YouTube has three such people. So, number of memcached e servers. We'll touch on this briefly today, but there's this really challenging problem that you face when you start getting not you know, your mom and your dad and you playing with problem set eight, but thousands of people all trying to hit it at some same time. Uh, second in time during some same hour, some same day. And bear in mind that the way you guys have been approaching problem set seven and problem set eight is every time you or some family member pulled up one of your web pages that ended in .php, that PHP code was quickly being、um, compiled at runtime or really interpreted by the web server, and then the results were spit out to the web page. Even if 
a user had just pulled up that same page one second ago, and there was no change in the state of the world between the first such pulling up of the page and the second such retrieval of the page. In other words, there's a lot of inherent inefficiency in your problem set sevens and problem sets eights, because every time you guys go through the trouble or force the CPU and our web server to go through the trouble of interpreting your PHP code, generating XHTML, spitting it out to the browser, you're never actually saving the results, right? They're gone. Because the next time someone asks for that same page, even the same user, you do that whole process again. And so, what Memcached is a freely available a piece of software, server software, whose sole purpose in life is to cache the output of things like PHP files. So any website like yours or like Facebook that's driven by databases and a bit of code, whereby the two together output XHTML, the purpose of Memcached is to take that output and cache it, keep a copy around for maybe a second, maybe five seconds, maybe an hour, so that subsequent requests for your same friend's profile on Facebook is served not by PHP querying the database, iterating through millions of rows and regenerating some web page, but rather you just go get the local copy from the Memcache server. So we do this on CS50's own website. We use、uh, Google Calendar to maintain our schedule of office hours because it's nice, it's user friendly. And, but what we do is grab that data with some PHP scripts we wrote from Google only once per minute. So if a TF goes in and changes his or her office hours, you guys actually don't see the results for at least up to 60 seconds. Now, in the context of the course, Who really cares? It's not all that big a deal. But something like Facebook, if you update your profile and then reload the page and you don't actually see the results because Facebook has decided to cache pages for 60 seconds, thereby confusing the user or making you think this, was, this update was not successful, there's really interesting problems that arise from that. Because then the user is going to probably try to make the change again and again and again in 60 times in 60 seconds when really the first was successful. So these aren't the.、Um, The cure all for scalability, but it is an option. So, how many do these companies use? MySQL for its website uses two, Sun uses eight, Flickr 14, Photolog 40, kind of a trend here, Wikipedia 79. Uh, Facebook 805.、Um, everyone kind of chuckled every time Facebook dropped its bomb、uh, in answer to these questions, and YouTube could not say. <laughs>、um, operating system, more of a curious note, but just to give you a sense of that it's not just Linux and it's not just Mac OS and Windows out there. There are many different flavors of these things. MySQL uses Fedora, which is the same version of Linux we use in the cloud.、Uh, Sun uses their own called Open Solaris. Flickr uses some undisclosed flavor of Linux. Photolog, something called Solaris, also. By Sun. Wikipedia, apparently a combination of Fedora and Ubuntu. Ubuntu, if you've ever used the terminals in the Science Center basement, B14, those Linux boxes are running Ubuntu. Facebook uses Fedora and also some number of Red Hat Enterprise Linux、uh, servers, which is pretty much the same thing, but you pay for one, you get support with one, the latter.、Uh, and YouTube claims to use SUSE, which is another flavor of Linux.、Um, and finally, just to give you a sense that There's many interesting architectural decisions beyond those that you get to play with in this course. We in the course have a web server on the, cloud,、uh, on the cloud. We have a database server there. We have all those SSH servers there. But for the most part, we've lumped everything together. But really, there are opportunities when it comes time to scale things to have. Obviously, clusters of databases that you connect to, maybe pseudo randomly or a little more intelligently. Clusters of web servers so that you're not hitting the same server again and again, but any number of different servers. And so there's these opportunities to have different tiers where you have a, a facade of web servers and behind them are database servers, but there's not necessarily a one to one relationship between any of those boxes. Any one can talk to any other. So, web servers are just the、uh, pieces of software, the devices that serve up static content, or who then turn around and say, Database, can you give me some content so I can then spit out the answer to the user? So, with that said, the number of web servers、uh, that you, MySQL uses is two Flickr 160 plus, Flickr 244. Photolog 70, Wikipedia 70 plus 200. I actually don't remember what the plus 200 meant, so I just put them both there. Facebook 1200,、um, and YouTube, I cannot say.
So anyhow, what these numbers hopefully give you a sense for is just the magnitude of some of the sites out there. Um, omitted perhaps glaringly is Google, which is reputed to have an amazing infrastructure um, largely consisting of cheap commodity hardware, each of whose PCs just solves a little bit of the day's problem, Sur uh, executing your search query, compiling results. Um, so there's even more interesting, if not proprietary, options besides these as well. So with that said, how does this all relate? And what can we do with this information? So let's tell a quick story that we started a, couple, a week or two ago, aborted, so we'll return here. So how do you go about taking your amazing implementation of problem set 8 or problem set 7 and putting it out there for real people to use? Well, one, you might want to go ahead and buy a domain name, something like malin.com, uh, anything vain like that. How do you do it? You go to a registrar, a website like godaddy.com, which has a goofy name. And if you visit their website, um, use scantily clad women to sell .coms and .net domains. It's a very strange business, but it's consistent. But they're sort of the biggest registrar out there. Last time I checked, um, and you pay something like $9.99 to go ahead and buy a domain. But there are dozens of other registrars these days, all competitively priced. So now you own Malin.com or something similar. You need to tell GoDaddy or whoever you bought it from that you have, uh, you need to tell them who your DNS servers are, domain name system. And these are just servers whose sole purpose in life is to translate IP addresses into domain names and vice versa, so that there's that layer of indirection. So you type it in. What do you type in? Well, you type in an address that belongs to your web host. So in the case of CS50, which we announced um, in the final project spec, we are happy to host your own websites for up to 12 months using a commercial provider that we're paying a few dollars to per month so that your projects can outlive the course without our having to run the server ourselves. Well, you would simply tell that company, DreamHost in that case, uh, rather you would tell GoDaddy that you're using DreamHost to host your website. And when it comes time to actually implement your final projects, we'll field questions along these lines. There are, of course, many options these days. This is a list of the most popular top-level domains. Um, we won't dwell so much on this, but almost all of these should look familiar to you. Um, and you have your choice these days of such things. We have CS50.tv because the small Pacific Island nation of Tuvalu decided to sell off the rights of their domain name years ago. .tv being theirs has nothing to do with television per se. Um, but we, like many others, hopped on that bandwagon, shelled out like 1999 because we wanted to have CS50.tv for the course's podcast. So silly things are possible as well. Well, what are the relevant details here? Just to give you a taste, and we'll see soon how this relates to the question of scalability, this whole infrastructure called DNS, which in simple form translates IPs to domain names and back and forth, also does other things. It informs the world of who your mail servers are, so that when you email mailin at post.harvard.edu, there's some server in the world that knows what machine handles email for the domain post.harvard.edu, or more generally, harvard.edu. And it has records that simply the DNS system in the world also, again, has this pairing between IPs and host names. Um, this is a little snippet just to give you a sense of these things. I went ahead and I think I mentioned a week or two ago I have the uh, clever fortune of owning mailinrouge.com. And this is just an excerpt from the server that's hosting this particular website that there's apparently what's called an A record whose IP address is 64.whatever. And that is how the world knows what the IP address is of that server. Because I have informed my own web host this, from which this excerpt is. And we have also informed GoDaddy that it's this server that actually contains these mappings of IPs to host names. And so the system just kind of works. And if for more on this, just Google something like how DNS works. Today's point is simply to point out the existence of this system and what it can do for you. Um, this is a little story. If you'd like to pull up uh, a HowStuffWorks.com article, whose URL is down here, there is a very nice hierarchical structure to this whole process, whereby there's also servers in the world that pretty much know uh, who the authorities are for all of the .coms in the world, all of the .nets, and all of the .orgs, and so forth. So there's a hierarchy to all of this, because there's millions of domain names certainly in use today. So you now own a domain name. You've decided on what's called a web host, whether it's CS50, whether it's DreamHost, whether it's this other company that the course uses uh, called Servant for one of our servers. You pay them a few dollars a month. You inform GoDaddy who you're using. And then you start uploading files to your account on this web host provider. And you use SFTP or FTP, things you've used in the course. And you might even have access to SSH so that you can do things at the command line. So in short, much of what we've been doing in the course is actually a mirror of what's done in the 
the real world these days when it comes to using Linux servers, when it comes to hosting web software. So suppose though, it's one thing to get your website up and running and for just a few people here and there to use it, but what if you kind of uh, hit on a really good idea and your website is way more popular than the problem set it started out to be or the final project it started out to be? Well, how many hits per second would you guess a typical Linux web server, like ours in the cloud, can handle per second? In other words, how many users can pull up your copy of CS50's mashup per second on our web server? 10? Fortunately, it's a lot more than that. Otherwise, we'd have a lot of servers if we needed to scale. Another guess. I heard 1,000 and what? OK, I heard 1,000 as well. So yeah, it's more in the low thousands. And you can figure this out by using various tools that quote unquote benchmark your server. And we've done this before, and I've done this for various consulting projects where you take the client's web server, you run some software, most of it's freely available, that just simulates a whole lot of HTTP requests. And this is not hard. Even you guys in PHP code have been simulating HTTP requests to get uh, uh, financial data from Yahoo and more recently stuff from Google. So it's very easy to pretend to be a browser, and so you pretend to be a browser browser as fast as you possibly can. And for a server that might cost $1,000, $5,000 these days, sort of a uh, business-oriented server, you can probably handle 2,000, 3,000 hits per second on a fairly decent server, and many more if you actually shell out yet more money than that. But there's kind of a problem here, because if you've just got one web server running, say, your increasingly popular website, you're going to begin to hit bottlenecks. Like, what are the things that are, what are the pinch points that are going to hit you first, do you think? Why might things eventually start to slow down? OK, bandwidth. So you might actually have a limit on your internet connection. If you're running this server out of your home, odds are you're limited by your cable modem or DSL connection. And odds are that's not even going to fly with your ISP anyway. Um, if you're using a commercial web host, odds are they specify in your contract how many bits per second you're allowed to spit out at uh, once over the course of a month, or even how many megabytes or gigabytes total you can transfer. So bandwidth is certainly one limit. What's another, would you think? Another limit on the number of users you can tolerate per second on your site. CPU, so right, so there's only so many things that your CPU can do per second. In fact, a useful tool that some of you have played with on the cloud in most any Linux box is something called TOP. If you run T-O-P, enter, what you'll see is a fairly arcane looking interface that simply reports to you what's going on on the server. This is a snapshot of one of the servers in the cloud, and as all of these zeros suggest, there's really not much going on there right now at the, time, at the moment. So in fact, looking up here, there's only two people even logged into this particular box, and what's called the load average is terribly, terribly low. This means uh, 0.0, .0, the computer is doing practically nothing. So I'll apologize again for the various slowdowns that we've had with the cloud uh, over the course of the semester as we've sort of learned as we go. Most of them had nothing to do with CPU limits. It was often misconfiguration issues or other problems that we bumped up against because quite often when we would respond on the bulletin board saying, no, the load on the server looks okay, the slowdown must be the result of something else, it's because we were looking at this little tool and saying the load average is pretty low, there's nothing consuming CPU or RAM at the moment. All of these zeros under percent CPU and memory means that only at this moment 1% of the CPU and the memory of this machine are actually being used. But apparently, take a guess, what is someone doing right now, perhaps in this very room? Maybe running their import script. They're doing something with the MySQL database because apparently it's, oh, that was someone's. Um, uh, something interesting is actually happening on the server. But fortunately, we have a whole bunch of servers in this cluster. This is another arcane command that tells you all of the different routing tables that we have. So we actually have five different servers right now uh, serving up SSH connections whose IP addresses are very similar to what you might have in your own home. They're at top left. 192.168.whatever. But as you can see here, on each of these five servers, there's zero people who have connected via SSH to this one, six people on this, seven on this, six, and six. Some of these connections might be in this very room. Some of them might be in their dorm rooms right now. And others might just be idle connections that someone left from the past several days or hours. So there's a lot of interesting infrastructure back there to handle what has been, over the course of the semester, a somewhat increasing load. You did try to crack passwords early on. You tried to um, 
Uh, parse very large dictionaries. Even now, you're dealing with 40,000 some odd rows of database tables. And as we kind of learned the hard way, when you have 300 students and students who are learning to program, students who are learning to program kind of make mistakes and kind of write infinite loops sometimes and kind of eat up gigabytes of RAM sometimes. And so it was these kinds of issues, frankly, that were often bringing these machines to their knees. And I'll admit, uh, there are certain staff members who sometimes write infinite loops and other such things. Um, so we too have been at fault. But it all boils down to a lot of these basics. How much of the CPU is being consumed? How much RAM is being consumed? How much disk is being consumed? And unfortunately, we ourselves had growing pains and hit almost every one of these limits at some point this semester. But there is sort of a, a, the, a ceiling on how much hardware you can throw at a problem. So your website becomes twice as popular overnight. Well, hopefully you have enough spare cycles and enough spare RAM to handle that increased load. But otherwise, if you're sort of bumping up against your machine's uh, limits, you're at 90% utilization of resources, 99%. The easiest solution, perhaps, is to throw money at the problem. Go out and buy the server that's twice as fancy, has twice as much RAM, twice as many cores or CPUs. But even then, as you know from the real world and the consumer markets, you often pay a premium. So it's not going to cost you two times as much for the, neck, the best and the fastest it might cost you four times as much. So that's perhaps not an appealing option. And what's sort of the logical uh, wall you run up against if your solution is to throw money at this particular problem and just buy bigger and faster servers to replace your older one? What's that? Yeah. Exactly. Eventually, there will be no faster, no bigger, more souped up server because you are at the top of the line. And that's kind of a problem because what then do you do with your users? And I imagine this is exactly what companies like YouTube originally faced, Facebook originally faced, because they didn't start out, Facebook, with 1,200 web servers. They probably started out with one or something that was co-hosted with someone else. And so these problems very quickly creep up on you, especially because all it takes these days is to get mentioned in some blog or some website like Slashdot. And there's a reason the so-called Slashdot e effect exists. This is that popular news site that I brought up a couple of times. If you have the fortune or misfortune of being quoted on that site or linked to on that site, and thousands of people at work with a little bit of free time decide to click on that link, your website will get pounded unexpectedly and you'll get peaks of utilization that you completely didn't expect. And so it's a really hard problem sort of figuring out where the equilibrium is between how much you pay for that, how much hardware you get for that, when otherwise it's usually sitting there unused. So this is all about vertical scaling. If you're throwing money at the problem and you're just trying to get more RAM, more CPUs, more disk space, you're going to bump up against financial limits and also against just real world limits. The stuff doesn't exist anymore. And so a far more robust solution is generally considered to be horizontal scaling. And this is just a buzzword that describes the idea of not sort of souping your hardware up to the top of the line, but rather going the cheaper route. Buy four of the cheapest low-end boxes instead of one server that's equivalent to all of those because it'll be a lot cheaper. And this way, if one of them fails, well, big deal. You have three others. In Facebook's case, they have, what, 1,800 database servers. If one of them dies, well, who cares? You have 1,799 others that can take over the load. And so horizontal scaling is all about redundancy and having a lot of duplication of data, a lot of duplication of resources because your more important metric is, say, response time. Right? It is remarkable, if you actually stop to think about it, how many millions of people visit Google every day and how many uh, websites they actually index. And when you search for something like CS50 and get back 416,000 results, it takes only 0.15 seconds. Like, this is a hard problem to solve. And again, we are losing out to this uh, wireless headset device still. But there we are, number four or five. We're, we're moving up. Um, so horizontal scaling is all about buying more hardware or renting more hardware, all of it identical and a lot of it commodity. So this is just a picture that out of context might seem a little strange, but these are excerpts from data centers. So data centers are big warehouses that have lots of air conditioning, lots of power, lots of bandwidth. These are just uninteresting cabinets with expensive hardware inside. This is a look at how much ethernet cabling it takes to actually connect hundreds of servers together uh, to one another. These facilities are actually kind of cool. Harvard has a couple of these on its own campuses and even in New York, for this company that I can sold for, we recently relocated to a facility that is similarly sized. There are hundreds of other customers um, in this particular facility, and it's you know, uh, equipped with the 
uh, biometric hand scanners and you have to go through like three doors. There's a man trap whereby you have to walk in one door, doors got a lock behind you, then can you actually go through the other door um, to actually enter the facility. So people take these things very seriously, um, but there's some really interesting engineering problems going on and that's our focus today. So how do you make use of hardware when you have dozens of servers and you have hundreds of servers and each of them has not just one CPU anymore but two CPUs, four CPUs, 32 CPUs or really cores as some of your own computers do have multiple ones today. Well one approach to taking advantage of all of this computing power is this idea of virtualization and we've been using this throughout much of the semester. This whole notion of cloud computing is largely based on the ability to take one souped up fancy server and chop it up into the illusion of multiple smaller servers, each of which can be rented to someone or given to someone and each of which can allow that person to have unfettered administrator access. So when we go ahead and actually bring more machines, more virtual machines alive into CS50's cloud, what we are simply doing is typing a command that queries Amazon for an available virtual machine that we then add to our router's table so that the internet knows when one of you tries to SSH to cloud.cs50.net there's not four but now five VMs that you can be directed to or six or seven. So this is actually neat stuff. In a co uh, consumer context most of you guys are like 60% of you guys according to our surveys are still running PCs, 40% of you are running Macs but at least half of, roughly half of you have the ability to run either operating system on your own computer. So if you actually have a Mac, you can download or buy software that allows you to run Windows, uh, Windows XP, Windows Vista, inside of a uh, window on your computer screen. VMware Fusion is one such example and as an aside um, we actually have site licenses for this for CS50 students. If this is something you'd like to do or play with if you own a Mac and you want to run Windows on your Mac but not in that dual boot sense, not in the boot camp sense where you have to shut down your computer and reboot it in Windows. If you want to run Mac OS and Windows simultaneously, uh, drop sysadmins at CS50 a note and we'll help you make that possible. But there are other options as well. Zen is freely available and it's what Amazon's EC2 cloud service is based on. So they are using this freely available software developed um, by a university faculty member years ago with his research team and now sort of commercialized and spun off as well for free. And this is something you yourself can download, install on some random PC that was given to you and you too can start running multiple servers even in your dorm room thanks to this notion of virtualization. So cloud computing is again sort of an instance of that. It's more of a buzzword than anything but it's all about taking advantage of all of these spare cycles and partitioning them up into the illusion of multiple servers. But let's bring this closer to home now. So in the context of running using a DreamHost account or running your own web server, much like we've been doing for you thus far, what can you do to improve the performance of your own code? Well, what were some of the things you guys did in problem set, uh, what was it, six for diction, for, mis, uh, for the misspelling problem set to optimize your code? What tricks did you ultimately come up with, if any? Yes, very impressive. <laughs> what, what were some, all right, so you've had your first version, took a really long time, you were down there with like Ken Perino on the big board, right? That was the lower bound. So how did you eke above that? All right, let's make this more real. And if, where is Ken here today? Hi, Ken. <laughs> yes, Nina. All right, so not using malloc, not using or at least using conservatively any function calls that themselves are expensive. And something like malloc, which involves communication with the operating system, tends to be expensive because you have to switch back and forth from your code to the operating system's code. So minimizing the calls to malloc or not using it at all was one way to chip away at your time. What else was sort of within your power? All right, so better hash functions, right? Actually thinking about your algorithms and your data structures and putting a little more intelligence into the design of your software and worrying a little less about the actual hardware that's executing it. What else proved useful? Good. So avoiding calling functions unnecessarily, moving around your code, uh, tightening up your loops so that you're not doing anything more times than you actually need to. What else? Okay, binary operations, and what kind of example comes to mind? Okay, 
So perhaps using some bitwise operators to get at lower level bits instead of operating on entire 32 bit ints, as opposed to just say 8, byte,、uh, 8 bit characters. So there were a lot of options within your control as sort of a computer scientist, or at least as a software developer. But there's also some low hanging fruit that's available to you if you're just running your own web server. So as we said a bit ago, so PHP is kind of a slow, inefficient language by nature because it's interpreted, which means it's a little slower in principle than something like C, a compiled language, because every time you execute it, the PHP executable, user slash user bin PHP, Looks at your code, analyzes it from top to bottom, left to right, and translates it essentially into something that the local computer understands. Well, fortunately, people have realized well, this is kind of an obvious opportunity for improvement. Rather than make PHP do this again and again, especially in the context of a website which might be serving up the same content again and again, why don't we cache the results of this compilation? Not the actual web pages that are being served up, but it turns out that when PHPs are actually executed, Yes, they are interpreted, read top to bottom, left to right, but they're in a sense compiled. But they're compiled just in time, not by you, but by the web server or by the PHP interpreter. So all of what looks like、uh, pseudo English to you, the PHP source code, does get translated to something that's closer to zeros and ones, but by default, those zeros and ones are then thrown out, and the PHP script is reinterpreted the next time. So there exist what are called、uh, opcat, opcode caches. Um, there exist tools that allow you to optimize the execution of your own code, similar to how GDB supports some flags. Some of you took advantage of this, right? What were, you were able to get for free some performance boost of your code, most likely, just by recompiling with a specific option. Anyone? So, dash zero, so dash O for optimization, and three is the highest level of optimization. Now, back in the day, you would actually really feel the impact when you're compiling your code. What might take a second to compile normally might take 10 or 20 seconds to compile if you've actually turned on optimization, as with that simple flag. Now, the upside is the code runs faster, but it gets really annoying to recompile and recompile your code during development. But the fact that CPUs are getting so much faster these days and RAM is faster means that that kind of Of impact was largely immaterial, most likely to you guys. So, this kind of stuff exists in the world of PHP. If you like this kind of stuff and are tempted to even run your own server, even if it's via a virtual machine running Linux on your Mac、uh, computer or on your PC, check out perhaps any one of these so called accelerators. Well, there's eventually a breaking point where you only have. You know, the ability to handle what? 2,000 requests per second or 3,000 requests per second, but the problem is you're getting millions of hits per day or hundreds of thousands per hour, and so one server just physically doesn't cut it anymore, even if it is in fact the top of the line. So, this is perhaps a leading question with the diagram up here, like this, if you're familiar. But if clearly one server no longer fits the bill, what's an obvious solution to scaling? If you've simply exhausted the capacity of individual servers? This is one of those softball questions, right? More servers, right? So if one server is not cutting it, you need to have multiple servers, or two servers, three servers, much like we do with the cloud. But some interesting problems arise as a result. So, problem second,、uh, how to first, how could you go about presenting to the world multiple web servers as though they are just one? Right? You probably don't want to tell the world, well, for today's late breaking news, go to CNN.com. But if you reach a file not found error or server too busy, instead go to CNN2.com. And if that's busy, go to CNN3.com.、Right? Like, there's got to be a better way, and there is. So, what basic building blocks might let us actually implement the illusion of one server, but really there's multiple behind it? Everything's been nicely packaged today, so the answer lies in the past. 30 minutes. Okay. Does that help? What's the answer? I stalled for you. Anyone? Yes. A load balancer would be a good guess.、Um, <laughs> How about in slide 16 or prior? So that's the right idea. You want to balance the load. What, what system exists in this world that might allow us to send one person this way, another person that way?、Uh, keep murmuring. I haven't heard it yet. 
DNS. All right, vaguely heard DNS over here, or NES, so we'll go with it. So DNS. So if there exists this system that translates domain names to IP addresses, why don't we sort of leverage a technology that already exists and has for 10, 20, 30 years already? So why don't I just set up two identical web servers? I'm going to put my PHP files on both of them, and I'm going to go ahead I'm going to have uh, my PHP files identical on both of them, all of my JPEGs, all of my GIFs identically placed on both of these web servers. So they look identical to the world, but they have different IP addresses, as is generally the case whenever you have multiple computers on a local network. But then I go ahead into my DNS server, however that's done. In the context of DreamHost, you pull up a nice web page that lets you change these things. In the context of our cloud setup, we go to another similar web page at GoDaddy. And you do this any number of ways, but you inform the world that, you know what, the IP address of CNN.com is not just 1.2.3.4 but it's also 1.2.3.5 and maybe even 1.2.3.6. In other words, you just tell the world that there's a whole bunch of IP addresses that you can actually go to via TCP IP to request the day's news and you just tell different people different things. And so one of the means by which you load balance at what's called layer 4, which is the TCP layer, uh, for more on this, take CS143 in a year or so's time, where you'll spend more time on these details. But you simply tell the world, much like this snippet of a configuration file tells the world, that CNN is both 157.166.224.25, but also 26, and those two other IPs. And the means by which I came up with that, quite simply, were I ran a command, which exists on Macs, Windows, and Linux boxes in different forms. And I ran nslookup uh, cnn.com. And what I got back was this list. So ns is name server lookup. It's a command available on most Linux boxes. And I just asked the world, what are the IP addresses of this server? And what this means is, when I pull up cnn.com, my browser is essentially told that the uh, website is at this first IP, or maybe the second IP or the other. And what, web ser what DNS servers often do is they just do this round robin, right? There's no intelligence here. There's no pseudo randomness. It's just plus, 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 mod, plus, 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 and just give the next available IP address. And what this means is that, and this is invariably a distraction because everyone glimpses the day's news in the middle of class, but we'll risk it nonetheless. If I go ahead and visit CNN.com, that's obviously going to work. But if I also visit HTTP colon slash slash this IP address, similarly, does that come up as well? Oh, and apparently, if you've not read the news, we are in a recession as of December 2007. So the news catches up a bit slowly. <laughs> um, Notice, too, I can go to that same URL, slash index.html, and get the same page. So again, some of these basic building blocks that we've been relying on in the cloud and in the course of servers, same thing out there in the real world. But unfortunately, you run into problems, right? Suppose that one of your servers goes down, so one of your four servers, one of your five servers, one of your 1,800 servers. And so the world is still being informed that your IP address is any number of 1,800 addresses. Well, obviously, one over one, eight, uh, one over uh, eighteen hundredth of your users are going to reach a dead end. So what's the solution to the situation in which one server goes down and you need to now stop users from going there? Take it off this list, right? So stop telling the world, right? I'm not really asking hard questions today. So don't to inform the world that this is still the IP address. But again, there's kind of this theme. And almost everything we've done this course is rarely that easy. Because also, for, design, for reasons of good design and reasons of optimization, browsers, operating systems, and also intermediate DNS servers in the world have been designed in such a way that they cache these DNS answers for at least a minute, for sometimes four hours, for sometimes three days. And so you run into what are called DNS propagation challenges, which makes a very simple problem and a seemingly very simple solution really a headache. Because if it means one of your servers goes down, it doesn't fly to simply take it out of rotation by editing a list like this. Because one fourth of your users might still have cached that particular IP address, and so they'll still reach a dead end for up to four hours. And so what might seem nice and might be fine for sort of the simplest of websites out there, it's not good if you're trying to make money or you're someone like Google. You can't have some percentage of your users hitting a dead end for four hours and sometimes 72 hours. And so there's hopefully a better way. Uh, with that teaser, perhaps, we'll get to the better way after like, a two-minute break here.
So, um, just a random aside. So, uh, actually, actually, if we really want to point out random stupid internet things, I think if you do go to such sites as uh, isitchristmas.com, still works. <laughs> but if uh, almost every one of these stupid websites that exist just for the sake of existing, if you start poking around its code, you'll often see that the authors like to play with people and start calling you names if you're actually of the type who views the source of web pages just to see what's there. So perhaps that's a takeaway from today, too. Look at web pages source code and see what's actually underneath there. But the problem that actually exists that we left off with was this problem of load balancing. And we said that DNS was not an adequate solution because um, you run into some gotchas for good reasons. Caching is generally good. It improves, optim uh, it improves the efficiency of things. It avoids redundancy. But there's also some downsides of it as well. So there's also this notion of layer, uh, load balancing at layer 7. Layer 7 relates to the HTTP, or application layer, which conceptually is a little higher than the zeros and ones that are the uh, TCP IP layer. So it's sort of an arbitrary distinction. But you can do this in code, in other words. For instance, I don't know if they do this anymore with the newer version of Facebook, but for many years, and as recently as this past, early this fall or maybe this summer, before they rolled out the changes, could you infer one way in which Facebook load balanced its users across many servers? So the URL, and you might sort of have taken this for granted, but if you came from some high school that had a different Facebook network or can't transfer from another university, what was interesting about the URLs that they used to and maybe still use? Yeah, so each of them began with your network's name, like harvard.facebook.com or mit.facebook.com. And this is, in a sense, another way of load balancing. You embed the location of your servers in the actual host name of the address so that when that IP address is resolved, it's sent to, say, a different server via DNS. Now, that might create the same problems, but what you can even do is have all of those networks map to the same address. So harvard.edu, or rather, harvard.facebook.com, MIT, facebook.com in theory all of those could even though it seems a little weird resolve to the same one IP address but then their own PHP code or really some fancy load balancer devices that they have these days could just look at the incoming HTTP request which you guys can look at yourselves with Firefox's uh, live HTTP headers sniffer you can see this stuff going across the wire they could do it layer 7 in PHP code look at that header and say oh this is a Harvard network request let me send the user to this database or to this web server as opposed to this one. And so the takeaway here is that there's many different opportunities for this kind of thing. And even in your own code, could you just have a simple condition? So early on, you know, several years ago, there might have been a branch, a uh, fork in the road of the PHP code that Facebook wrote that said, if uh, uh, network equals equals Harvard, then MySQL connect harvard.database.facebook.com, else connect to everyone else dot my, uh, database. Dot my, uh, dot Facebook, dot com. In other words, you could just do it in code. And that's what layer 7 load balancing hints at. But there's a problem there, too. So you guys have been using dollar sign underscore session quite a bit. So that session, that super global, gives you the illusion of shared storage space. So if the user visits you, then goes away for a few minutes, maybe even a day, but then comes back and they've not closed that browser window, they're still going to be logged in most likely. And their contents of their shopping cart are still going to be there. And that's thanks to what are called sessions, with which you're familiar. But how are those things implemented? Well, PHP and uh, uh, the web server we're using to serve up PHP pages is pretty much stateless. That is, there's no chunk of memory that's reserved for your sessions. Rather, disk space is used. And so if we actually go back onto the cloud and I go into a directory called slash scratch and I do an ls, there's a huge number of files in here right now, all of which begin with SESS underscore and then a really cryptic string. Well, that string is identical to the cookies that have been planted on each and one of your computers over the past few weeks, past few days, by the web server pseudo randomly. So when you actually have that server object, Remember that it's remembered or it's associated with your browser by way of a cookie. Well, that cookie's unique ID is stored not only in your client on your laptop, but it's also stored server side. Now, by default, you can't read other people's session files. Only the super user, the root user, like I at this moment, could actually look inside here. But if I looked at some of these things, I would see things like, UIDs that are currently logged into the website, uh, the CS50 store, which should debut this uh, Wednesday for students. You'll see literally the contents of someone's shopping cart, thanks to these session objects. 
and other such things that might be there. But this is a problem because if you now have multiple servers and a user is visiting your website, maybe to buy some object or browse some Facebook profile, and they've been sent to server number one. Uh, but the next time they visit your website because of various load balancing techniques, whether it's DNS, whether it's something more intelligent, they are sent to server number two, which remember we configured identically. We copied the same JPEG, same GIF, same PHP files there, but what per presumably is not actually there? the same session file. So there's these problems now where your, your initial goal was to separate everything, just have lots of redundancy, all of it identical, all toward an end of efficiency. But now this kind of comes back to bite you because now if you're sort of pseudo-randomly sending one, someone to different servers or sending them to a different server based on their school's name, but even within that cluster there's multiple Harvard Facebook servers, it seems now you have to remember which server an individual user was on. But now you're back to the original problem problem, what if that server goes down? Then whatever percent of users happen to be probabilistically using that server at the time, now they're screwed because now they reach a dead end. So you seem to sort of need independence of servers, but then when you want some very reasonable features like sessions, you get sucked back into this need for shared storage. Well, long story short, there are different ways of tackling this. What's important or interesting to us today is just the mere existence of these problems, right? Just as you're finishing up this course and might think, oh, okay, I kind of understand all this stuff and all how, how it all fits together. Like there's so many more opportunities for interesting questions and design decisions. Well, the short answer is to how we do this is this directory called slash scratch actually doesn't exist on all of the back-end virtual machines in the cloud. It exists on one server at the moment, which granted is a potential single point of failure, but what we do is use file sharing essentially to expose that one directory to all five of the other back-end virtual machines so that it appears to be present on all of them. There are trade-offs though. Now that we're serving up things over file sharing, what's one implication for performance, do you think? It's slower, right? Because networks are slower than keeping everything locally, presumably, right? Your own network connection is not as fast when you're, say, using a dial-up modem as opposed to being on a local area network. So there's a performance impact of being just on a network in the first place. Um, there's obviously, in this case, the single point of failure. So even though, and we have this, we've showed you this diagram, it might look nice and fancy, or at least on first glance, but there ha is and has been a single point of failure. If our primary virtual machine that we uh, casually call the front end VM goes down, everybody's screwed, including us, because we can't get to um, the rest of the servers because so much is actually running on that front end VM. But this was a design decision on our part. We realized, all right, there is a low probability that something will go wrong with this one box and therefore cripple the whole infrastructure. But the upside, at least in Amazon's case, is that even if one of their data centers goes down, they have three, at least three main data centers, East 1A, 1B, 1C we can actually within 10 minutes move the entire infrastructure I, on, uh, thanks to DNS in part to a different geography altogether and we decided that this low probability um, sort of weighed against the relative ease of just moving the whole infrastructure with 10 min within 10 minutes was sort of acceptable. So we tick off our students for 10 minutes but most of them probably aren't using the cl cloud at that moment in time so it was sort of an acceptable loss. So as often as we might hear complaints from some of you I mean, sometimes these were conscious decisions because the alternative to have an infrastructure that's up 99.999% of the time which is sort of the industry standard, uh, five nines of availability is really expensive and really hard to meet. And certainly we as a course, you know, can't, you know, with me and Cato and Glenn needing to sleep once in a while, I can't guarantee numbers like that. But they were design decisions, sort of with calculated risks. So if you've solved that problem, how do you go about actually balancing your load across multiple servers? Well, if you like this kind of stuff, and again, I can't emphasize enough the relative ease with which you can play if you are sort of geekily enough inclined to download like a virtual machine, install Linux on it, or find some cheap PC or get a friend to give you some old PC that's pretty useless for Windows or Mac OS but could run Linux very nicely, you can play with all these kinds of things and even serve up your own web pages in your dorm room subject perhaps to some FAS firewall restrictions these days that I know get in the way of things like uh, Wii's and maybe Gamebot um, uh, and uh, Xboxes and such. But anyway, 
How else can you do this? Well, there's also hardware solutions, which are beyond the scope of this course. But you, if you like to sort of play with big, expensive toys, when you start to deal with sites like Google and Facebook, there are certain pieces of hardware that companies do spend tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars on. And often those are things like load balancers, which are just really fast devices that do nothing else than take requests in and then farm them out to multiple, multiple sites, much like we're doing with this picture from front end to multiple back ends, but we did it sort of the free off the shelf way because it's enough, certainly for our load. So what else? So there's this theme of caching and we can actually tie this together to other real world sites like Craigslist. So it turns out that serving up HTML pages is so much faster in the grand scheme of things than interpreting, executing, and then spitting out the results of PHP files or most any language altogether. Because if it's just static content, all the web server needs to do is call the equivalent of fopen, do a bunch of freads, and fwrite it out onto the internet. So it's just spitting out the bits without even looking at them, so to speak. But there are, other, there are ways then to exploit this idea of caching. So Craigslist, if you have ever visited uh, any of its sections, has like a jobs section and uh, apartment sections and other sections all together. But you'll notice that many of them end, if you look closely at the URL, with just .html even though this is a uh, dynamic website in that people are constantly adding new job descriptions and new apartment listings. And yet what Craigslist appears to do, their design decision years ago, was to take a user's input and then generate once and only once a .html file that represents their post. And if the user decides to change their posting by way of that little link that they get emailed, well, then they just delete this particular HTML file and overwrite it with a new one. But if you've ever posted to Craigslist, you'll know that there's like a mo several minute, maybe even hour delay before it actually appears because they too made the conscious design decision to say, eh, this is a free website. People are advertising you know, junk on it most of the time. We don't need to have you know, millisecond response times to posting ads. Facebook, by contrast, has sort of prided itself on making sure that any updates to profiles are immediately accessible. So they sort of prioritized another metric. But in this case here, HTML itself is sort of the cache that's being used. You take the input from the user, generate the page, generate it just once, and then cache it until such time as the user changes it, which odds are is very infrequent. So there too is sort of the basic metric that's very often comes up in database design. Is our reads more important or our writes more important? How about problem set eight? Those of you who have dived in, which is going to be more common in your implementation, reads or writes of your MySQL database? Probably just reads, right? You're going to do writes, that is inserts, once. When you write and then run your import script that one initial time. And the only reason you're writing that program, that script called import, is not because it's going to be useful beyond the moment you write it, but because it's so much easier to write a script that iterates over uh, tens of thousands of lines, pulls out just 40,000 of them, and inserts them for you, rather than the alternative, which is maybe open in Excel and sort of copy, paste, copy, paste. Right? There comes a point, and you'll encounter this, I'm sure, with various student group projects or even course projects, where there's a line between how much time it's going to take to do something the easy manual way in the future, whether it's with Excel or something else, versus the time that it will take to write a script to do it for you so that you can go off and do something more interesting. And hopefully that particular component of problem set eight will teach you a lesson that even though we've taken from you hundreds of hours this semester, um, over time perhaps you'll begin to reacquire some of those with these time saving tricks. There are other tricks though that you get for free. MySQL, we don't bother with it because we don't have these scalability problems for the course, but you can go into a config file and change a zero to a one for a variable called query cache type. And what this simply does is it tells my C MySQL, if you re receive a request for a select statement and you return some results, remember those results for at least a few minutes so that if the user makes that same identical request again and the table has not changed, just give them the results from the cache. So you get some of these features really for free just by turning them on. MenCacheD is sort of a fancier approach to this altogether, but it's freely available. Facebook itself uses it and I believe has even contributed updates to the open source that is this project. Um, and it too does that same idea, caches the results, but you put them there for you. And this snippet of PHP code is just an example of how you would do a database query, grab something from the database, and then cache it. Because relatively speaking, you'll find it faster to get something from cache, even memcache, 
than going back to the database. So this too is a recurring theme. Just as earlier in the course, you wanted to avoid disk as much as possible and keep things in RAM, same deal with actual websites. You want to avoid your database as much as possible and just keep things on disk because they're a little faster. And then if you can avoid disk by using memory caches like this thing, even better still. So it's all relative, these kinds of things. So just to give you one more teaser on design decisions that you can incorporate, perhaps, into your final projects, if using SQL at all, or even into projects in the future, you'll notice, or should now notice, that there are different database engines that you can use when defining your tables. And we don't care, really, for the problem sets in this course, which ones you use. By default, you've been using something called MyISAM, which is just Think of this as a uh, file system for databases. So if you're even familiar with this in the world of Windows, there's like NTFS, there's FAT, there's FAT16, FAT32. Um, most of you are just using NTFS these days. But databases similarly have different ways of storing data that you can exercise some control over. But each of these engines, MyISAM, InnoDB, and others, have different features. For instance, MyISAM tends to be very fast, but it doesn't support what are called transactions. So though we uh, spoke of it only briefly, that whole problem of ATMs and trying to take out money and update the records, but avoiding the risk that the ATM might actually crash during that process, well, you can avoid that by using transactions, but not if you want to use MyISAM. You have to use a different database engine with MySQL, one called InnoDB, trade-off. It's slower, at least for certain operations. So understanding your data, understanding your own code, ultimately really figures into the kinds of even low-level decisions you make or initial decisions you make. Another one that's actually pretty neat is called the heap or memory table type. And as the name implies, this is a MySQL table that exists only in RAM. So you can put as much stuff in it as you want, but as soon as you shut down the server or restart the uh, database server, you lose the contents of it. So what might that lend itself nicely to? What kinds of database needs? Temporary, yeah, exactly. Where you just want to put something in the database temporarily, you want subsequent selects to be really fast, but uh, if it disappears, so be it. So it takes you a few seconds at startup to bring your website back up to full functionality, but you're willing to spend that up front so that amortized across many, many, many more requests and hours, everyone else's operations are really fast because the whole thing's actually in RAM. Well, uh, this is an excerpt, if you like this kind of stuff, from MySQL's own documentation that gives you just a teaser of the different trade-offs and using different file systems here. And you'll notice hints of stuff that'll come up in like CS124. So there are different types of trees you can use. B-tree tends to be the most uh, common for indexes. So recall that indexes in the context of a database are little fancy data structures that expedite searches on certain fields in your database. Well, B-tree it's not binary tree, it's a little fancier than that, but it's often used in databases for performance reasons. But there are other options still. So there's a database class actually at Harvard, uh, CS165, aka 265, that covers those types of topics in detail. Now, I promised to come, or we saw this earlier today, this notion of masters and slaves, just to paint a picture with those same ideas. This is the sort of thing that Facebook is doing. So they had, what, 900 masters and 900 slaves. The idea is that, and I don't know their exact topology, but maybe one slave is replicating one master, or maybe uh, multiple masters are all identical copies of one another, and they too have read-only copies called slaves. But this is the kind of diagram that you start to think about if you have to tolerate lots and lots of requests and lots of inserts per second. Again, you do your writes to the master, but your reads to the slave. And if you lose a slave, if it breaks, who cares? It's just a redundant copy for performance reasons. Um, there's another um, problem, though, with this topology, is that you again have this notion of single point of failure. If your master database dies, you're kind of screwed in this case, like, much like we are with the cloud, because if our front end VM goes down, it's going to take us some time, realistically, to bring it back up. So when one is not enough, there's that brilliant line in what the movie Contact with Jodie Foster, like why, what is it? Why? build one of something when you can build two at twice the cost. I mean, that's kind of what the theme boils down to, redundancy. Sometimes you do have to pay for it. And sometimes the best solution is buy twice as many things as you need so that you can tolerate not 100%, but at least with high probability failure of one of these devices. So in this notion, which exists in MySQL and other database engines altogether, you have two masters. And you can write to either of them. But they're configured in such a way that a write in one eventually gets copied over to the other. But there, the obvious trade off of that is what? Or what's the obvious gotcha there? What's that? 
Uh, say again? OK, so definitely the cost, right? Paying twice as much is certainly worse than paying one, a factor of one. But what else? If you write to one database, but it has to be copied to the other, Perfect. So there's lag time. There's some potential consistency issues where you know, maybe it takes a second, which is pretty darn fast these days. But in that second, what if 10 users, what if 100 users happen to query not the right-hand master database, but the left-hand one, which hasn't yet received that update? They're going to see stale data. So that, too, is a database decision and probably affects even sites like Facebook because they, too, have to worry about those trade-offs in the low probability or high probability that some server actually goes down. And you can get really fancy. So this topology here suggests that you have a fancy, expensive device or cheap, free software called a load balancer. It directs traffic over any number of web servers. Each of them then talks to a separate load balancer that then separates traffic across multiple MySQL databases. So these basic ideas, these building blocks of tree structures kind of recur in the real world when it comes to physically connecting servers together. You can also partition the data. And this is what I believe Facebook did early on, where they put all of Harvard's stuff on one server or in one MySQL database. They put all of MIT's in another and so forth. And another approach to Scaling is just partition your data. If you know arbitrarily that for the most part, at least, Harvard people are only going to be connected to Harvard people, then put them all on the same server and don't worry about other websites or other networks. And I think early on this was mostly the case. Nowadays, there's lots of intermingling. Those of you who came up with Facebook through high school obviously have lots of friends elsewhere. And so this affected Facebook. Like the more of you that sort of exited high school and entered college and had all of these interconnections, they presumably had to deal with that issue of interconnectivity. And you can no longer have a separate database probably for every school because you're going to be connecting to all of them anyway. Just to find a person's friends who are spread out all over the place. Um, high availability is a theme here that we'll just slap a label on here, but it refers to the same idea. The goal being high, making your service highly available. And then there's, this, there's yet further sophisticated features of databases like clustering, whereby you have a whole bunch of servers. You don't connect to one in particular. You sort of let the cluster manage connections for you. But the neat thing is with clustering technologies is if one database fails, well, the others literally take up the load. And it's often thanks to some very basic building block like that bitwise XOR operator. Um, if you're at all curious how that relates, Google something like RAID and XOR, and you'll see how you can take n copies of data, or rather n plus 1 copies of data, essentially make the n plus 1th of them the XOR result of everything else. And if you lose any one of those n plus 1 hard drives, you can recover the data from all of the others, thanks very simply to that simple bitwise operation XOR. So you will have faculty joining us on Wednesday from several different classes. We will see you then back in Sanders. <laughs>